Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof, or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press. It began as an afterthought from a bigger idea in an inchoate nation of former colonies under the tyrannical rule of the British crown. Yet it had its roots in a justiciable controversy arising under seditious libel in the courts of New York under the British crown in 1735, which was later described as the germ of American freedom, the morning star of that liberty which subsequently revolutionized America. During a period of social unrest that divided a nation between slave and free, described by one American president as a house divided, that spirit gave rise to the formation of at least 40 indigenous movement publications, such as the Freedom Journal, the first African-American newspaper, as well as Frederick Douglass's North Star and the Colored American, later renamed the Weekly Advocate, founded by Charles Ray and Samuel Cornish, both black Presbyterian clergymen, but also William Lloyd Garrison's The Liberator, yet none of which triggered judicial scrutiny despite a controversy that would test the mettle of the nation's very founding to be decided by a great civil war. It was not until the heat of the civil rights struggle when quoting a 1911 precedent that the right of the fourth estate to write the first draft of history would once again be tested under a case brought in libel where the court examined the proposition that the power to create presumptions is not a means of escape from constitutional restrictions. And that court, the Supreme Court, the highest court in the land, held that under the laws of the state of Alabama, mere negligence or carelessness is not evidence of actual malice or malice in fact, and does not justify an award of exemplary or punitive damages. The concept of a presumption echoes strongly throughout American jurisprudence as in the instance of the strong presumption in favor of a plaintiff's choice of forum, especially if the plaintiff is an American and the forum is an American court. As articulated in USO Core v. Mizuho Holding Company, a Seventh Circuit case decided in 2008. In the courts of the Commonwealth, it has been observed by the court in Purvis v. Commonwealth, a case decided by the courts of appeal in the year 2000, that the introduction of inadmissible evidence of another crime confuses one offense with the other and by showing that the accused has a criminal propensity tends to reverse his presumption of innocence and that in a bench trial the judge is presumed to be to disregard prejudicial or inadmissible evidence and this presumption will control in the absence of clear evidence to the contrary echoing the words of the nation's highest court. In the case of Brown v. Payton, a criminal case decided in 2005 that if a prosecutor had stood before a jury and denied that a defendant was entitled to a presumption of innocence, if the judge refused to correct him and failed to give any instruction on the presumption of innocence, if the judge's instructions affirmatively suggested there might not be a presumption of innocence, would anyone doubt that there was a reasonable possibility that the jury had been misled? Yet, upon mandates issued by governors state nationwide, a mandate intended to become the law of the land by the president-elect Joe Biden, despite the guidance from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, the nation's public health authority, that non-medical grade facial coverings are recommended as a simple barrier to help prevent respiratory droplets from traveling into the air and onto other people. When the person wearing the mask coughs, sneezes, talks, or raises their voice, which is called source control of the infected person, every able-bodied American man and woman in the face of an invisible enemy has been presumed to be infected with a highly infectious and lethal disease, in which every medical research study has found the overwhelming majority of patients to exhibit at most mild symptoms, 
such as fever or mild pneumonia, and for which even the World Health Organization could not find any evidence of an infectious disease after examination of the tracer contacts from over 55,000 laboratory confirmed cases and could not find a secondary infection exceeding 5%, indicating that 95 of every 100 American citizens would escape infection even while violating social distancing protocols determined to be within six feet. In Schenck v. United States, an insurrection case decided by the nation's highest court in 1919, the majority stated that we admit in many places and in ordinary times, the defendants in saying all that was said in the circular would have been within their constitutional rights. But the character of every act depends upon the circumstances in which it is done. The most stringent protection of free speech would not protect a man in falsely shouting fire in a theater and causing a panic. It does not even protect a man from an injunction against uttering words that may have all the effect of force. The question in every case is whether the words used are used in such circumstances and are of such a nature as to create a clear and present danger that they will bring about the substantive evils that Congress has a right to prevent. It is a question of proximity and degree. When a nation is at war, many things that might be said in a time of peace are such a hindrance to its effort that their utterance will not be endured so long as men fight, and that no court could regard them as protected by any constitutional right. It seems to be admitted that if an actual obstruction of the recruiting service were proved, liability for words that produced that effect might be enforced. The statute of 1917 in section four punishes conspiracies to obstruct as well as actual obstruction. If the act speaking or circulating a paper, its tendency and the intent with which it is done are the same, we perceive no ground for saying that success alone warrants making the act a crime. Indeed, that case might be said to dispose of the present contention if the president covers all media concludendi. But as the right to free speech was not referred to specially, we have thought fit to add a few words. On June 13th, reporters from the Washington Post stated in the story with a very misleading headline that four months of discord about the coronavirus epidemic have transformed the cloth mask into a potent political symbol. Touted by Democrats as a key part of communal responsibility, labeled by some GOP leaders as a sign of government overreach as a scarlet letter penned on the week. In that article, they made claims during a time of public health crisis, screaming fire in a theater, that according to Pew Research Center, found 57% of African Americans and Latinos in reasonable apprehension of grave bodily harm or death from infection by a novel coronavirus, that a spate of new research supports wearing masks to control coronavirus spread, lending them feelings of efficacy and empowerment in pandemic. But five paragraphs down, the report is stated with regard to the non-medical grade facial coverage that, that, that a loyal Democrat party constituency were mandated to wear under the threat of criminal prosecution, that the conclusion came with an important caveat. We have low certainty in that, meaning the authors cannot strongly, be strongly confident in the result. These findings, despite the misleading headline promoting the efficacy of facial coverings and syndicated across the nation, only serve to confirm the conclusions of a pre-pandemic study performed by the National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health in 2010, which tested non-medical grade substitutes using the same diagnostic equipment that is used to rate the N95 and other medical grade protective personal equipment, and it failed a decade ago. Under the holdings of the Virginia State Supreme Court in Thompson v. Bacon decided in 1993, a party alleging fraud must prove by clear and convincing evidence a false representation of a material fact made intentionally and knowingly with the intent to mislead, reliance by the party misled, and resulting damage to him. Detrimental reliance 
clear and convincing evidence is such proof as will establish in the trier of fact a firm belief or conviction concerning the allegations that must be established. And a reasonable person would be left with a firm conviction that a mistake had been made if any court decided upon these facts that in this instance at least the Washington Post, if not other representatives of the press, had fraudulently induced the African American community to grant preferential favor to the Democratic Party nominees like Joe Biden, especially given the fact, as validated by Pew Research Center, that just as strongly as that demographic accepts as holy writ the words written in their Bibles, they are at least inclined, the, the least inclined to question the words that are printed by the press, rendering such a deceit wholly unconscionable. In a poll conducted by Virginia State University in Petersburg just prior to the election, it was determined that African Americans represented only 19% of the over 5 million eligible voters in Virginia, that 97% of them were registered as Democrats, and that over 67% of them had voted in every November election since 2017 and were probably going to vote again in 2020. While over 47% of the residents of Richmond are African Americans, who represent over 60% of the fatalities in Richmond, over 23% of the voters in the city of Alexandria are African American. And an African American candidate was not only denied his statutory right, but qualification to appear on that ballot by the city government and the courts, but also found reported from the Washington Post, as well as other Virginia progressive news media in con co collusion to silence his voice with regard to the national pandemic that had adversely affected his fellow African Americans, representing a chilling effect upon the exercise of First Amendment rights and a travesty of justice. In Virginia, Joe Biden defeated the president by a margin of two times higher than the victory margin of Hillary Clinton in the 2016 election. And in Virginia's 8th Congressional District, the 58th most reliable congressional district in the nation, and the King Maker District, for statewide races for the past two decades, Joe Biden defeated the president by 56 points, a congressional district where African Americans alone represent 14% of the vote and where Latinos represent 18.5%. As any litigator knows, due process is that process that is due. As reiterated by the courts of the Commonwealth and Dix in LLC v. Virginia Alcoholic Beverage Control Board in 2002, as long as it is even debatable that a rational relationship exists between government policy and a conceivable government objective, there is no substantial due process violation. However, just as recently reiterated by the U.S. Supreme Court in Department of Homeland Security v. Board of Regents for the University of California, a DACA case, Judicial review of agency action is limited to the grounds that the agency invoked when it took the action classified at the time. In Jacobson v. Massachusetts, a case involving a mandate for vaccinations for smallpox, a disease that has been validated under science to possess a 60% attack rate, the Supreme Court stated that if a statute purporting to have been enacted to protect the public health the public morals or the public safety has no real or substantial relation to those objects or is beyond all question a plain palpable invasion of rights secured by the fundamental law it is the duty of the court to so a judge and thereby give effect to the constitution moreover under the holding in whole woman's health care the hellerstedt an abortion case decided by the supreme court in 2016 a state law is constitutional if one it does not have the purpose or effect of placing a substantial obstacle in the path of a person's rights. And two, if that regulation is reasonably related to or designed to further a legitimate state interest and electing Democrats is not a legitimate state interest. In West Virginia State Board of Education v. Barnett, a case decided in 1943, the majority of the U.S. Supreme Court stated that if there is any fixed star in our constitutional constellation, it is that no official, high or petty, can prescribe what shall be orthodox in politics, nationalism, religion, or other matters of opinion, or for citizens to confess by word or act their faith therein. But today, under law, we have instituted a good Samaritan law that mandates that every man has to abide by whatever a scientist says.
namely Dr. Fauci. In 1969, in the case of Stanley v. Georgia, the same Supreme Court stated that whatsoever, whatever the power of the state to control public dissemination of ideas is inimical to the public morality, it cannot constitutionally premise legislation on the desirability of controlling a person's private thoughts. In Farid v. Smith, a case decided by the Second Circuit in 1988, that court, that Supreme Court held that in determining whether there is a violation of the free exercise clause, courts must assess, one, whether the practice asserted is a religious practice in the person's scheme of beliefs and whether the belief is sincerely held, two, whether the challenge practice infringes upon the religious belief, and three, whether the challenge practice furthers some legitimate objective by the government. Under these precedents, commencing in March, we filed suit in the Circuit Court for the City of Alexandria to enjoin those regulations from infringing upon the free exercise rights of Virginians to worship as they choose, to compel the City of Alexandria and the governor to implement measure to, that had been published by the World Health Organization in February to prevent the fatalities amongst the elderly in nursing homes who today represent over half of the fatalities to a novel coronavirus and to seek a pandemic exception that had been created to, for every other voter and every other candidate but was denied in disparate treatment for lack of a judicial, justiciable controversy. While the governor chose the peculiar defense tactic of evading the service of a summons from the sheriff for the city of Alexandria. Under these precedents, specifically citing the failure of the governor and the Virginia Department of Health to validate the existence of a highly infectious disease, we brought suit in the federal district court in the city of Richmond, and again the governor, through his counsel at the office of the Attorney General Mark Herring, chose the peculiar defense strategy of evading a summons being served by the United States Marshal. An evasion of a summons constitutes the felony of obstruction of justice, as well Al Capone knows, because that is how he was arrested for the first time under 18 U.S.C. Section 1512 and is punishable by fine and up to 20 years in prison for each offense. We should never forget that everything Adolf Hitler did in Germany was legal and everything the Hungarian freedom fighters did in Hungary was illegal, said Reverend King, a friend of my father. It was illegal to aid and comfort a Jew in Hitler's Germany. Even so, I am sure, he said, had I lived in Germany at the time, I would have aided and comforted my Jewish brothers. And if today I lived in a communist country where certain principles dear to the Christian faith are suppressed, I would openly advocate disobeying that country's anti-religious laws and of record I have lived up to the word of Reverend King. Under 18 U.S.C. Section 241, if two or more persons conspire to injure, oppress, threaten, or intimidate any person in any state, territory, commonwealth, possession, or district in the free exercise or enjoyment of any right or privilege secured to him by the Constitution or the laws of the United States, or because of his having so exercised them, they shall be fined under this title or imprisoned not more than 10 years or both. And as the grandson of a franchise monarch, and as a former, as well as the grandson of a former primary school teacher in a segregated schoolhouse just south of Danville, Virginia, who lost everything they owned in life during a North Carolina election in 1924, including their church and their parsonage home and their chosen professions, we will be filing with the Fourth Circuit a motion to compel the issue of a writ of mandamus to the Federal District Court in Richmond to convene a grand jury as required under Federal Rule of Criminal Procedure 6, which states when the public interest so requires, the court must must mandatorily must order that one or more grand juries be summoned my name is major mike webb and by god i am running for governor of virginia i ask every christian every conservative every republican every virginian and every true american to like the motto of the infantry says follow me and we shall overcome honest
This advertisement was authorized by Mike Webb.